Hey, what's up guys? It's Dr. D Flo, and I'm here with a follow-up to my how to build a CNC plasma cutter video. This video is gonna be a little all over the place. We're gonna try out the affordable Cut 50L on the plasma table, cut some mild steel, do a little welding, and go to a wedding. This is an atypical Dr. D Flo video, but let's get started. Dr. D Flo. Before we talk about the Cut 50L, I want to show you the two modifications that I made to the lead plasma table. First up, I add an emergency stop button. This button is wired to the door alarm terminals on the black box. So pressing the button pauses the CNC motion and turns off the relay for the torch trigger. I can use the emergency stop button to pause the machine between consecutive cuts without losing positioning. The second modification was changes to the slats. I did away with the 3D printed slat holders. They lasted much longer than I thought they would, but after a couple of weeks, they became very brittle and cracked with the smallest movement of the slats. I was going to cut a slat system out with a plasma cutter, but I had some extra aluminum extrusion and right angle brackets from the table build that I decided to use instead. The extrusion sits on the bottom of the water tray and the right angle brackets hold the slats upright. If you're building your first plasma cutter like I was, then with this method, you don't need a 3D printer, chop saw, or a friend with a plasma cutter to get your water table ready. Next up, we have the Cut 50L. I teased this plasma cutter in the last video because its sub $400 price tag and claims of low frequency operation make this cutter a natural pairing with the lead plasma table. Even though this plasma cutter is named the Cut 50L, it's actually very different than the Cut 50, which as we saw in the previous video was a noisy headache. Let's take a look at the front panel of these two plasma cutters. The Cut 50L has an extra connection for the pilot arc. If you're not familiar, a pilot arc allows the torch to establish an arc without being close to the workpiece. The pilot arc can cut through insulating materials like rust and paint before establishing the primary arc. For CNC, a pilot arc is pretty much a requirement because there's a much lower chance that the primary arc will fail to establish when a pilot arc is used. It's simply more reliable. Because almost all plasma cutters found on CNC tables have a pilot arc, a common misconception is that if a plasma cutter has a pilot arc, then it must be a low frequency plasma cutter. This is not the case. Pilot arcs are found on plasma cutters with high or low frequency starts. It's worth quickly diving into the operating principles of high frequency and low frequency start systems. High frequency start relies on a high voltage to ionize the air between the work and the torch's nozzle. The primary arc, which is low voltage and high current, now has a path of low impedance to the ground clamp. There are no moving parts with this technology, so it's very reliable. However, as we saw in the last video, the high frequency noise can be problematic when near electronics. A form of low frequency arc ignition is known as blowback or moving start. The way the blowback start works is pretty ingenious, albeit a little bit more complicated. Let me give you a brief overview. The negative electrode is spring loaded and is forced up against the positive nozzle forming a dead short when the trigger is pulled. When the plasma cutter opens up the solenoid to allow the compressed gas to flow, there is nowhere for the gas to go because the electrode is blocking the nozzle's orifice but due to the high pressure of the air, the electrode is forced back, compressing the spring. As the electrode moves away from the nozzle, an arc is formed in order to maintain this short circuit. Perhaps now you can understand why it's called blowback start. The electrode is blown back from the nozzle as the compressed air rushes to escape. Okay, enough theory. The Cut 50L says it is low frequency, and the torch looks to support blowback start, so let's hook it up to the table. The air hose is connected in the back of the machine to the little water separator that is already installed. The documentation says that the plasma cutter needs 40 to 60 psi of compressed air, but doesn't specify the flow rate. The other Cut 50 was very economical when it came to air consumption, so I hope that holds true for this cutter as well. I 3D printed another torch mount out of a heat treatable PLA filament. The previous 3D printed torch mount held up surprisingly well. I will throw a link in the description for buying this filament from Matter Hackers. The first cut will be an engineered square out of 1 8 inch thick mild steel.
no electrical interference on startup, so definitely low frequency start. For not even optimizing the travel speed or torch height, this part had minimal draws. Also, my little air compressor didn't turn on during the cut, so that points to lower air consumption. For a hobbyist, lower air consumption is preferable because you don't have to purchase a large, power-hungry, two-stage compressor. However, less airflow means the torch can't evacuate the molten material as fast. This isn't noticeable when cutting thinner material, but it could be a potential problem if you want to cut material closer to the machine's max cut thickness, which is half an inch. Now that we know the Cut 50L works with the lead plasma table, I can put it to work. The first project is going to be a decorative piece for my sister's wedding. My mom reached out and said she wanted me to make a love sign out of wine corks to hang at the reception. Now that is an oddly specific request, but I like to do projects for my family so that whenever they come over and say, hey David, do you really need all this stuff in your garage? I can quickly follow that up with, remember that time I made a love sign out of corks for you? So yes, I need everything in this garage. Here's the bag of corks my mom gave me. Looks like she was drinking a lot of wine and champagne. To make this sign, I'm going to plasma cut the letters for love out of 16th gauge mild steel. This is thin material, so the travel speed will be 2,000 millimeters per minute. Each letter is going to be about 15 inches or 400 millimeters tall and wide. I made this sign as big as I could fit in my car. Each letter has holes cut into it so that I can band all the letters together with flat stock in the back. While I was plasma cutting the letters, Andy was cutting corks in half on the horizontal bandsaw. By cutting the corks in half, we would get a little more mileage per cork, and there would be more surface area for gluing them down to the letters. To tie all the letters together, I used two six foot long pieces of half inch by half inch flat stock. I used the mill to drill holes that corresponded to the mounting points in the letters. 
I promise in the next video, I'm gonna use this mill beyond its drill press capabilities to machine over five unique parts out of aluminum, so get subscribed if you're not already. I then tapped those holes I just drilled for M5 bolts because I wanted to be able to remove the letters for storage. I have three siblings and my sister is the first one to get married, so hopefully we can squeeze a couple more uses out of it. At the end of the video, I will have some footage of the sign hanging up at the venue if you're interested. One of the reasons that this video took so long to release was because the love sign was a surprise and I couldn't put this video up until after the wedding. My next project with the Cut 50L comes from Etsy. I found a DXF file for a beer caddy. It's basically just a metal version of the cardboard six packs you get from the store. I thought this would be a reusable and durable way to transport drinks to events when everything goes back to normal. The plasma cutter has a duty cycle of 60% at 40 amps. Cutting out all the parts for this beer caddy was estimated to be about six minutes. So this would be a great way to verify the manufacturer's claim. Did you see that? The arc changed from a red-orange to a blue for a split second. And if you listen closely, you can hear some sputtering. This occurred on and off for the rest of the cut. What this means is there is most likely something wrong with the electrode. After I took off the shield cap, my suspicion was confirmed. The electrode is in bad shape. As soon as a deep pit forms in your electrode, you will want to switch it out. I suspect there to be an additional problem because I've only run the plasma cutter for about 30 minutes and the electrode should have lasted much longer than that. Premature electrode wear is almost always moisture in the compressed airline. I did not emphasize this in my first video, but the air going into the torch needs to be extremely dry. The little water trap on the back of the plasma cutter rarely is sufficient. My air compressor is located underneath the plasma table, which is poor placement because it is sucking in the human air created by the water table. I have an inline motor guard filter to remove moisture from the air. Let's pop it open to see if I need to change the filter. As soon as I took the cover off, you can see water dripping out. That filter, which started out white, is a great visual for how dirty compressed air is. If you don't use a filter, then all of those particulates will find their way into your plasma cutter, which will significantly shorten the life of not only the consumables, but also the machine itself. I will pop in a replacement filter. Unfortunately, these filters have to be replaced often. With my setup, I'm having to change the filter after about five hours of cutting, and these toilet paper roll looking filters are not cheap. I'm looking into some different options. While I'm recutting that piece for the beer caddy, I do have to say that short consumable life appeared to be a characteristic of this plasma cutter. Even with a new filter, I was getting about 45 minutes to an hour of electrode life when I was working on future projects. In contrast, I never replaced the electrode on the Cutmaster 40, and I ran that plasma cutter for many hours. Fortunately, consumables for the IPT40 hand torch are really cheap, but it is a hassle to have to keep changing the electrodes. With all the beer caddy pieces cut out, it's time to weld them together. Up until a couple weeks ago, I had never owned a welder before. This is why I'm very excited to announce that the Dr. D-Flow channel is partnering with HTP America. Along with access to the welding experts, HTP sent out their new ProPulse 220, a multi-process machine that is capable of MIG, TIG, and stick welding. The 220 can pretty much do anything that a hobbyist like me could throw at it. Now I had to admit to HTP that I am inexperienced when it comes to welding. I have a little experience with my buddy's TIG machine, but that's about it. This is even more problematic because one of the most compelling features of the ProPulse 220 is its ability to do pulse MIG. And I have never MIG welded before. So HTP scheduled a week long boot camp to put me through the paces of MIG welding. 
I will take some good notes because the goal is to translate what I learned into a how to pull some MIG weld video. So definitely subscribe for that content. So for the rest of this video, please close your eyes if you have any experience with MIG welding. I will be welding with 030 steel wire. I wanted to try out the pulse MIG mode, so I picked up a tank of 90% argon and 10% CO2. A higher argon content is required because the spray arc needs a hotter gas. I set the material thickness to an eighth of an inch. This is a synergic machine, so it should adjust all the parameters automatically, so that even a rookie like me can get started quickly. Again, I'm going to make an in-depth video when I get formally trained, so let's just pull the trigger and hope that the welds don't look terrible. Hey, not bad. There was very little splatter when welding in pulse mode, and man, there was a lot of penetration. This little beer caddy doesn't need to be structurally sound, but it definitely is. I'm gonna throw a coat of spray paint on it. The handle is a little uncomfortable. It is mild steel after all, so Andy wrapped it with a leather cord. To keep people from opening their bottles on the side of the caddy and messing up the paint, I mounted a bottle opener. Now I have the kegerator for at home drinking activities and the beer caddy for when I need to travel. Obviously the one issue with this design is that it is made from mild steel, so it's a bit heavy. In a future video I will cut one out of aluminum and weld it together with a 220. This project will be in the next video I make on the lead plasma where I will discuss how to safely plasma cut aluminum. This video will also feature HTP's plasma cutter, the Microcut 875SC. HTP also sent out this cutter for me to demo, and it came with a CNC torch, which is awesome, and I'm very excited to use. I know that over the course of this video, I've mentioned like three future videos, but being able to weld has really expanded my capabilities. So I'm excited to share with you what I learn as I practice, and read your comments down below and on the Dr. D Flow form. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.